This is section 10 of The Mutiny of the Bounty and Other Narratives by William Bly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Life of a Sailor Boy, read by John Greenman. Chapter 6 Leaves the Service, Some Eminent Seamen. Our cruise terminated after a few skirmishes, and we returned to New York where I left the service, as I trusted for ever. As it occurred, my services as a seaman in a war vessel would not long have been required. The peace between England and France in 1814, by opening the continent to American commerce, hitherto excluded by British policy, naturally removed one of the grounds of quarrel, and opened the way for peace with the United States. On the 24th of December, 1814, a treaty of peace, accordingly, was effected at Ghent, which left, however, the question of right of search and other matters on the ground on which they had previously stood. The Americans were most successful in their naval warfare, but after all that was a trifling compensation for ruined commerce, and for being brought to the very verge of national dismemberment. In taking leave of the sea, it may be expected that I should say a few words respecting the life of a sailor. As I have already mentioned, the profession of a sailor has its hardships, but these were much greater at the time of my service than they are now. The duties of the men are now exactly regulated, and their comforts are cared for in many ways. On board of each vessel in the British Navy there are now means of instruction and a library and the savings of the men are carefully secured for them, or transmitted to their wives or friends. On shore, also, there are at various ports establishments called sailors' homes, where discharged seamen may reside at a moderate expense till engaged in a new vessel. At sea, as on land, steadiness, temperance, good temper, forbearance, and other good qualities are sure to command respect notwithstanding the severities of discipline. It is likewise most advantageous for a man to possess a good education, for the more he can make himself useful and be depended on, the greater is his chance of promotion. A properly bred sailor should, at the very least, be able to reef and steer, that is, adapt the sails to the wind whichever way it blows, and govern the vessel by the helm and compass. But besides these comparatively simple duties, he should likewise be able to throw and calculate by the log, to work a reckoning, take an observation, find the longitude, and keep a log-book in which all necessary particulars of the voyage are daily inscribed. The log is a contrivance for ascertaining the rate of speed at which a vessel goes. It consists of a long cord, having an oblong and loaded piece of wood attached to one end. This wood, when heaved overboard, remains stationary in the water, and consequently, as the vessel advances, the line must be let out from a reel held in the hand. The line is marked by knots and half-knots, representing miles and half-miles, and the number of these run off indicates the number of miles which the vessel is going at per hour. Every common seaman can cast the log and calculate the speed of the vessel from it, but few can do any more, because they are contented to remain in ignorance, and inclined to spend their leisure hour in trifling amusements rather than in study. Of course, such persons cannot expect to rise in their profession. It is astonishing how many cases are on record of individuals who, with scarcely any other education than what has been procured on shipboard, and while serving in subordinate and laborious situations, have attained distinction. The celebrated English navigator Dampier, although he had been some time at school before he left his native country, would have grown up in a state of ignorance had he not exerted himself in self-instruction after he went to sea. Davis, the discoverer of the strait which bears his name, also went to sea when quite a boy, and must have acquired all his knowledge, both of science and literary composition, while engaged with the duties of his profession. Every one is acquainted with Cook's humble origin and his distinguished career. By his own persevering efforts did this great man raise himself from the lowest obscurity to a reputation wide as the world itself. But, better still than all his fame, 
than either the honors he received while living or those which when he was no more his country and mankind bestowed upon his memory he had exalted himself in the scale of moral and intellectual being had won for himself by his unwearied striving a new and nobler nature and taken a high place among the instructors and benefactors of mankind this alone is true temporal happiness a reward of all labor and study and virtuous activity and endurance vancouver was a sailor formed under cook and to him we owe an interesting ably written account of the voyage which he made round the world in seventeen ninety and the four following years falconer the author of the shipwreck a popular poem spent his life from childhood at sea falconer did not permit the success of his poetical efforts to withdraw him from his profession in which having transferred himself from the merchant service to the navy he continued to rise steadily till he was appointed purser of a man-of-war one of the best situations in the royal navy and which can be held only by a man of education robert drury who wrote an account of the island of madagascar and of his strange adventures there was also a self-taught sailor drury was only fourteen years of age when he set out on his first voyage in a vessel proceeding to india and he was shipwrecked in returning home on the island just mentioned where he remained in captivity for fifteen years so that when he at last contrived to make his escape he had almost forgotten his native language he afterwards however wrote an account of his shipwreck and residence in madagascar which remains a popular work till the present day other cases might be mentioned but these are enough to show that the hardships of a sailor's life are no serious bar to improvement provided he be true to himself and be guided by a proper sense of duty unfortunately for myself my neglect of moral improvement the abandonment of my country's service and my headlong folly and improvidence were errors now to be expiated having thrown myself adrift with but slender resources and far distant from my friends i experienced the fate of many a disbanded and penniless tar what hand to turn to for the means of subsistence i knew not determined at any rate to make an effort i went about to different parts of the country seeking employment i was not successful and at length my money was all gone and my shoes more than half worn out when reduced to this sad extremity and on the brink of despair i was so fortunate as to discover an old shipmate and through his kind influence his brother-in-law employed me to work in his clothes-dressing establishment as i was ignorant of the business and was not really needed my board was to be my only compensation i lived here happily for some time and then got employment of a more lucrative kind in another establishment where i settled and have since remained thankful to have attained a haven of rest after the turmoils and dangers of a sea life Note, the foregoing narrative is abridged with some alterations from a small work entitled thirty years from home or a voice from the main deck being the experience of samuel leach boston eighteen forty three end of chapter six and end of life of a sailor boy read by john greenman